the need reach the Christ in you. And when we do that, we are honoring the Christ in each and every one of us. Because that presence of God is within us all. So, Christ in me brings the Christ in you. 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 So you all can sit now. Please be seated. Rest in place. What a lovely day. So, if we could affirm Unity Williamsburg Spiritual Center together. Together. Unity Williamsburg Spiritual Center is a radiant center of divine life, light, and love. We are a thriving, prosperous spiritual community that honors the divine presence in all and celebrates our oneness through loving service in our community. And together, let us say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And leave us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And next week, Armand and Angelina will be here, so they will be singing the Lord's Prayer. So that's going to be pretty long. Yay. So please stand, and we got our second, con next congregational song. We are one in the spirit. <laughs> Center ourselves in one presence and one power, 
We realize that our thoughts have the power to heal and bless. We send them out now carrying love, peace, joy, and life to situations and celebrations that have been requested. Thought by thought and prayer by prayer to transform the world. Amen. And we know that when we pray together, it's extremely powerful. And also, if you wish to send a prayer to our prayer chaplains, um, we'll have an email address up there shortly, and you can send a prayer. You can also email Silent Unity, and they pray 24-7 too. So, lots of opportunities for prayer. And now I ask that our platform assistant, Paul Osman, come up and share the daily work with you. Good morning, everybody. Morning, morning, this is the day the Lord hath made, and let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we know everything is in divine order. And uh, earlier this week, I prepared a few thoughts from philosophers about autumn. And this morning, we had our first crisp autumn day. So, how's that for a perfect time? Divine order. So, here's some thoughts from some of the philosophers over the years on about autumn. From Albert Camus, autumn is a second spring when every flower, when every leaf becomes a flower. Isn't that a nice thought? You look at all these beautiful leaves and think of each one as a flower, second spring. From Walt Whitman, autumn shows us how beautiful it is to let things go. And from George Eliot, <clears throat> is this not a true autumn day? Just to st the still melancholy that I love, that makes life and nature harmonize. Very nice thought. And then probably the most famous philosopher of all, Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and Winnie says, it's the first day of autumn. This is a time of hot chocolate mornings Toasty marshmallow evenings and a chance to jump in the leaves. Great thought. Anyhow, happy autumn. I think it's kind of started today. <clears throat> in the daily word for today is world peace, which good Lord we need all that. And uh, the the Affirmation is, I am a peaceful presence to all. Can we say that together? I am a peaceful presence to all. <coughs> Peace in the world begins with me. I consider a sacred responsibility to respond to all people in all circumstances in a peaceful manner. I forgive myself for those moments that I am less than peaceful and quickly return to the peace of God in my heart. I am a living expression of God, just as all people are. My tranquil bearing inspires peacefulness wherever I go and with everyone I meet. Each day, I join like-minded people everywhere in a renewed commitment to be a presence of peace. I give thanks that as each of us communicate God love in our own unique ways, peace and harmony are established in individuals, in families, in communities, and among nations throughout the world. And we need that Lord. Peace in nations throughout the world. And the reading is, put things in order, listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. It's a good thought for autumn day. And the scripture for today is from the book of Revelation. And as you recall, uh, last week, Reverend Jenny had a talk on the first part of Revelation, and Reverend Denise is going to talk about part two today. So from the book of Revelation, a great sign appeared in heaven. <coughs> a woman clothed with the 
the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. So Reverend Bernice is going to expand on that and explain what that means in, in terms of, of unity principles. And after that, our Annie McGrath is going to play a special song, and I think all the older folks remember this, put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the waters. I know you all remember that. Reverend Bernice. Not happy, 
And then war broke out in heaven. This huge battle in heaven where Michael, Archangel Michael and his angels, angels were fighting with this dragon with the seven heads. And it was fierce. And then all of a sudden the dragon was thrown down into the earth. Just thrown down. And he was not happy then either. But the angels triumphed. They triumphed by throwing the dragon down to earth. The dragon was not strong enough. He was hurled to the earth and his followers with him. He was known as Satan or the devil. And then John, who was writing this, said, I heard a voice in the sky. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God, day and night, has been hurled down. The dragon, the accuser, has been hurled down. They triumph over him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their destiny. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink to death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given wings, as you can see here, eagle's wings, to fly away again back into the wilderness, where she would take care of a time and times and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and swept her away with a torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who kept God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. That's some story. We got angels, we got dragons, we got birth. <coughs> we got the dragon flown down, thrown down to earth. And the earth saves the day, right? That's pretty cool. So let us look at what Ed thinks of this story and how it relates to us. Now the woman is feminine, the divine feminine, and she represents love. And she's birthing the Christ consciousness. And we all know, us, us ladies, we know that it's difficult to give birth. It hurts, it's painful. Likewise, it's difficult awakening the Christ consciousness within us. We go through all these trials and tribulations. We think everything is fine and all of a sudden, wham, something is thrown in front of us, a dragon, and we gotta deal with that issue. We gotta deal with whatever is going on in your life that's painful, that hurts. It happens. We've all experienced, every one of us have experienced it. But we're expressing the energy of infinite light that is greater than the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the first creation. This Christ consciousness that we are birthing. It's greater than all of that. It's infinite, right? Because God is infinite. Christ's consciousness is infinite. If the moon and the stars and the earth are all going away and we're living on another planet somewhere, shooting up into a rocket, going to another planet, Christ's consciousness is still there. Everywhere. Everywhere present. Now the seven-headed red dragon is also contained within our own consciousness. It represents what traditional Christians call the devil. And what a course of miracles calls the ego. Now you can relate this. We're reading Barry Magdalene Revealed from book study on Saturdays. And in there she calls them, she relates them to seven powers. 
And we need to tame these powers, just like we need to tame the ego. We don't want to dismiss our ego. Because we are here to be fully human and fully divine. And we need our ego to live in this world, being fully human. We need that. But we need to tame it. We need to make it take a back seat to our spiritual, to our soul nature. When we're living only in ego, it's an expression of our ignorance of the presence of God, our true reality. And it's fear-based choices we make as a result of having forgotten our true selves. This great dragon is the metaphysical ringmaster of our entire unfolding drama. Every expression of shadow energy, both in our minds and in the world around us, comes from this dragon's fearful insistence on the limitation of duality. Now, when we came here in our physical form, we thought we were separate from God. We were thought we were separate from Source. And this dragon reinforces that. The dragon is the ego, reinforces that separation. But we all know here in unity, or in new thought, or quite frankly, in the early Gospels, like the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Thomas, they reinforced that oneness. That oneness and that there is no separation at all. This fierce dragon with seven heads of spiritual denial and crowns of earthly rule is precisely as powerful as we believe it is. So if you enforce that thought of separation, the ego becomes more powerful. But if you can live in that space of oneness, of wholeness, then those demons, those dragons, they dissipate. This transformative event of the entire revelation is painful and thrilling. It is painful to give birth, but it also can be thrilling, exciting. You get to the point where, what's next? Yeah, I'm going, with, I'm going through some tough times right now, but what's next? How is it going to unfold? And if you can believe, and if you know truly in your heart <coughs> that what's going to unfold is your highest and best, and you move forward, you move through it, it's going to be fabulous. There, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not a train. <clears throat> Nothing is more dreaded by the dragon of fear than the awakening to the truth of our Christ identity and divine empowerment. So it stands hard, ready to devour the new Christ consciousness before we can truly experience and embrace it. That's why it's so angry when God takes the baby away. To hide it. So we can look at that too. Because of our egos trying to take over, the Christ can be hidden within us. What was the saying sometime? Uh, maybe it was a, I can't remember now, a Buddha or something. Where is the Christ? Is it over here? Is it over there? Is it a tree over here? No, I hid it where no one can find it. I hid it within them. I hid it within each person. Because it takes time to realize that the Christ is within all of us. At least it did for me. Of course, the dragon of dualistic illusion cannot destroy the Christ of eternal truth. This newborn awareness within us is protected by the infinite presence and power of God, as is the creative energy that has given birth. There will be consequences to be faced in consciousness as a result of the birth, and our tentative new awareness is protected for whatever amount of mortal time we need to face them. One might expect that the birth of new dimension of Christ's awareness within us would inevitably lead to a life of peace and contentment. You think, right? There'd be angels singing all the time and you know, we'd be happy and joyful. But because we have lived a life, many of us, in a different place,
place where we were felt we were separate from God. And we have also buried some of this oneness and we've buried the awareness and we've buried that that divinity that when we start becoming aware of it, we start awakening to the Christ consciousness, birthing it out of us, that the other stuff that we've hidden comes back up. The things that we've done, the things that we've said, forgiveness, forgiving others, forgiving ourselves, all of that's going to come back up so you can release that and allow the Christ to fill you more. It's already there. But it just, the light has just been diminished. It's not cut out completely. I don't believe that. It's just been diminished. <clears throat> the truth is that just as Jesus' own baptism went to the Christ consciousness was followed by temptations in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, so were our own spiritual birth awakened and aroused the fear-based energies, the ego, that have been com comfortably calling the shots through our lives. The dragons are going to rear when we start stepping out because it's been in control for so long. Our egos have been in control, taking the front seat of the car and not the back seat of the car. So it's going to try its very best to throw stuff in front of you, to throw this, to throw that, to stop you on your path to full awareness. By anticipating this reaction, we can avoid the danger of being thrown off course by the intense energy it represents. This Christ consciousness that is within us, the divinity that is within us is so powerful that if we can hang on to that, connect with that, it will take us through. He writes, the blood of the lamb and the rod are the newly realized energy and understanding represented by the birth of the Christ awareness. The spiritual energy has already won the battle, although the fear-based energies in our mortal minds are still loud, are still shrill and chaotic in its efforts to dissuade us from our new commitment. The dragon or the devil knows his time is short and we are called to know the same truth as we move to the challenges of the life ahead. The battle has already been decided in heaven for our spiritual consciousness. We already know we're going to get there. It is now being acted out in the mortal realm and our mortal experience. But now we're awake and we are aware, consciously linked to the creative spiritual power that assures our victory. Both the child of the Christ consciousness and the creative energy from which it emerged are absolutely safe for the period of time required for us to deal with the challenges of dualistic conflict. We're safe. We know we're going to get there. We just have to do those ups and downs for our lives. And help from a surprising place, from Earth herself, home of the dualistic life experience, so often seems to be working against the dragon. Think about that. It was Earth that saved the woman and foiled the dragon. And a couple of weeks ago, I did a talk about wandering out in nature and how much it heals. And nature does heal. Earth can save us, not only we live here, but it can save us as we walk out into it and connect with it. Earth will save us. On many levels, but on a spiritual level, we can connect with the earth, the earth and it will give us peace and joy and as Bob was reading earlier, lessons. See how the earth is easily, trees are easily dropping their leaves. And at this time, how easy it is to let go what no longer serves. You don't see the trees kind of hanging onto their leaves like this, right? 
they're letting them go. It's a time for letting go. We always come to that time. And more often than not, we like to hang on to what we really need to let go. There's no divine denying that often painful experiences of conflict and ignorance. It's interested to our humility. But there is no sense of punishment involved. There's rather the innate awareness that these experiences are precisely our spiritual work to do. There's no sense of separation from God as a fact of our mortality. How can we possibly be separate from God of the omnipresence? How can we possibly be separate? How can even the forces of Satan occupy the realm called hell, which this guy's half of, the old Baltimore Catechism says, the absence of God. There is no absence of God. God is everywhere, all the time. No absence, within and without, everywhere present. And traditional religious beliefs, which believing that we are separate from the spiritual understanding, really seems to affirm the reality of this human experience of duality. That we are separate from God, that God is angry and is punishing us, and our only hope is to work ourselves back into good favor with God, so that when we leave this mortal realm, we go to heaven. It is the understanding belief that we have fallen from our exalted spiritual place, and that this human experience is intended as a form of punishment that allows a hierarchical religious, religious structure to govern our lives, passing down to us from high instructions from what God demands from us. The truth is, that the relationship between our Creator and the created is one of complete, intimate oneness. This principle is truly empowering. Our purpose in this human adventure is not blind obedience, but loving creation. And we are creating all the time. We are here to extend the experience of God as far as we possibly can. We are here to transform not only ourselves, and in doing so, we transform Earth. But we transform all. And as I slip into my shaman talk, because we are all part of the web of life. We are all part of the web of the universe. We are all part of the web of the cosmos. And wherever that connection is, that's where God is. There's no separation, zero. And we're finding that out in our study, the Mary Magdalene book, that's exactly what was taught in the early Jesus movement. That's what was taught. No separation, we are one. And how sad that over the years, it was changed and rearranged that we are separate from God. That's not what Jesus taught. Jesus taught oneness. And Jesus was here, also it states in the book, as our way shower. Jesus was not worshipped. He was our way shower. He was our elder brother. He taught us how to live. Because he was fully human and fully divine. And that is our goal. That is what we are here to do, being fully human and fully divine. And that's what we are birthing. That's what each of us, we're birthing that oneness, we're birthing that Christ awareness through us, through our heart, and moving it out into this glorious space. This glorious space. And the more we become aware, the more we live, the more we encompass that divinity and live by that divinity, being that divinity, where our lives are transformed. And in doing so, because we are connected to the web of life, the web of the universe, the web of the cosmos, 
Everything is affected. Everything. So as we transform, everything around us is transformed. The trees, the animals, the birds and the bees, all of it. That's how powerful we are because of the divinity, because of the God, because of the, the, the spirit that is within us and who we are. So always remember that. Yeah, we're going to go through some tough times. My goodness gracious, when we start birthing, we continue, because we already are. When we continue birthing the Christ consciousness within us, living by the Christ consciousness within us. But you know what? We're going to work through it. We're going to make it. It's going to be good. And you'll get to the point where you are excited. You know that what's happening is your highest and best to help you in that birthing process, to guide you in that birthing process. I was talking to Steve earlier today. We were talking about getting off ramps while we're on this interstate. And boy, those ramps can be real troubling. We can get lost, but we can find our way back if we believe truly in every fiber of our being who our true, who we are, our true selves. We'll get back on that interstate and we will continue to go. Hopefully not as fast as some of those folks on 64. It's kind of crazy out there, but we'll get there. Yes, we will. Bless be to you all. So I will say that Revelation ends wonderfully, just like I shared with you. We're going to end wonderfully. We're going to be fantastic. And that's how Revelation ends. But this is chapter 12. Andy's going to play a song, and feel free to sing along.
receive to help this community, the spiritual community, and we also help the community, the surrounding community, with spiritual outreach, community outreach. We thank you, thank you, and we know that as we give, we receive blessings. So now Bob has some announcements he'd like to share with you.
watches over us, I am present. Wherever we are, God is. I am divine. And yes, we are divine. Every single one of us, we are divine. So as we move out and we birth those children or ideas or whatever, it's difficult. But we know that we are not alone and we know we will make it through. So blessings to you all. Have a wonderful week. Please join us in fellowship if you wish. And you guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Blessed day. Thank you. Thank you.